Good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Dionis Dimdraoglos, for those who don't know. Uh, I hold the job of the Chair in Parliamentary Democracy and European Integration at Perpec. And it is under the auspices of this particular uh, chair that uh, we are organizing this event this evening, which uh, focuses on the crisis of the rule of law in the European Union uh, and, uh, as a consequence, the protection that might be uh, uh, afforded uh, necessarily in the future. Um, I will not be chairing this event today. I have uh, a special guest, Jennifer Ranking, who has kindly agreed uh, to play this role today, to perform the role of the chair of this event. Jennifer, uh, as uh, all of you will know, is the Brussels correspondent of The Guardian and one of the best uh, Brussels correspondent there are. I will simply say two things. Please keep your uh, microphones and cameras off but do use the chat facility on the right hand side in order to post comments and ask questions. Um, the event is being uh, video recorded and once the video recording is ready it will be uploaded on the Ramonia Chair's website um, and uh, Berkbeck's uh, YouTube channel uh, for future reference. Without further ado, I would like to welcome all of our uh, guests, and in particular, Jennifer Ranking, who, as I said, will chair in this event um, this evening. Mm -hmm. Okay, good evening. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, to be uh, joining you at this Jean Monnet event this evening, organized um, by the University of Birkbeck, and thank you, Zonistas, for asking me to do this and, and for your kind words. And this event is organized from the UK. I think many of you probably are, some of you are in the UK at least. And it's no secret, of course, that UK politics for the last five or more years has been dominated by the question of Brexit. But what we are going to talk about this evening, I think is, a far, is far more dangerous for the European Union than Brexit. And if we think of the European Union like a house, uh, Brexit was akin to somebody flouncing out of the front and slamming the door hard behind them, whereas the rule of law challenge to the EU is something more like uh, someone living in the house, smashing the supporting walls and digging away at the foundations. And I hope through this evening we'll, we will talk much more in detail about the threat to the rule of law in the EU uh, to make that analogy really meaningful for people. Um, and the threat to the rule of law is not confined to one country, and it's a dilemma that the EU has been wrestling with for perhaps 20 years when European leaders were confronted with the election of the far-right Freedom Party in Austria. So setting out the history of the EU's system for protecting the rule of law, we will hear from Laurent Pegg, who is Professor of European Law at Middlesex University, where he is um, also the author of more than 100 books and articles on European law. So exactly the person we need this evening to talk about the evolution of the rule of law in the EU. And he's also known, I don't know if he will like the term or not, but was as a new generation of activist academics who does not simply teach and analyze European politics, but advocates against rule of law violations. So we may hear more from him on that. I will then just briefly introduce our other speakers. We will then hear from Anna Wojcik, who is a fellow at the German Marshall Fund, uh, where she is also working at the Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, of, of Sciences. And she is one of the most knowledgeable experts on the crisis of the, the rule of law in Poland. So we're really pleased that she can join us this evening from Warsaw, where she's going to inform us about what is happening in, in Poland. And finally, uh, we will hear from Judith Sargentini, who joins us this evening from Amsterdam. Uh, she was a member of the European Parliament for 10 years until 2019. And in September 2018, she persuaded her fellow MEPs to back a call to trigger the EU's rule of law procedure, the Article 7 procedure against Hungary. And that was the first time this mechanism had ever been triggered by the European Parliament. And it's a story, of course, that is far from over. So she is going to reflect on her experiences um, in, in writing that report and in her discussions with colleagues and with the Hungarian government. But first of all, to, to set out the terrain, I will 
hand you over to to Laurent. And please, uh, um, I should also say as well that everyone here tonight is speaking in a personal capacity rather than through their organisation. And and just a message to all of you, please do think about the questions and the comments you might have for our, our guests and do write them in the chat. Uh, and then we will come to those once we have heard from the from the first from the speakers. But anyway, I think that's quite enough from me. And now I'm happy to pass over to Laurent. So over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to keep it uh, brief. Uh, so no more than 10 minutes. So Jennifer, if I do exceed 10 minutes, uh, just uh, do let me know. I'm just going to try to give you a, a broad overview, essentially, uh, of the situation. And uh, to get started, uh, perhaps it's always worth uh, reminding uh, ourselves that according to the EU treaties, uh, uh, the EU uh, shares, is supposed to be sharing a number of common values with the EU member states. And it's supposed, in fact, uh, to be based on, uh, on these foundational values. Uh, uh, they are to be found in uh, Article 2 of the Treaty on the uh, European Union. And these values include democracy and the rule of law and respect for human rights. These values have been mentioned as key EU values since the early 1970s, even though they were codified in the EU treaties only at the start of the early 1990s, uh, following the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, so these values have been part of the EU DNA uh, for more than 40, 50 years. So there's nothing really new about uh, these uh, key values from an EU's point of view. Uh, to join uh, the EU, uh, you have to, uh, uh, an, uh, an EU candidate country must uh, legally uh, commit itself to uh, not only complying, upholding uh, these values, but also to upholding them and promoting them post accession. So, for instance, uh, when we had a big wave of uh, new countries uh, joining the EU in 2004, uh, every single one of these uh, countries had to uh, commit uh, themselves to complying with uh, values such as the rule of law, including also uh, full compliance uh, with the case law of the Court of Justice, including the principle of primacy of EU law over the national constitution. Not that the, this is in fact uh, the issue at all uh, today in Poland and Hungary. Now, um, the long-held assumption in the EU has been that once you join the club, then there is no need to fear any backsliding as uh, regards uh, these uh, EU values. So for a long time, the EU treaties, in fact, did not provide for any specific uh, monitoring process or sanctioning process when it comes to uh, compliance with these values post-EU accession. Now, this assumption started to crumble in the late 1990s. Uh, Jennifer mentioned uh, the Austrian president, so to speak. So this was the first time, essentially, that uh, e individual EU member states were confronted with uh, a new governmental coalition, uh, which included uh, the mainstream right-wing party in Austria and extreme right-wing party. Um, this led to uh, what became known as Article 70. So, uh, Following uh, this Austrian episode, um, the EU member states decided that perhaps it would be good to provide for a formal treaty provision which would allow the EU to react in a situation where there is a possible systemic threat to EU values or an actual persistent breach of these EU values. So, in fact, Article 2, uh, sorry, Article 70 EU. Uh, was added in the EU uh, treaties uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, and then, in fact, uh, Article 70 EU was amended by the Nice Treaty of 2001. So since then, uh, we have had this uh, Article 7 of the TU. I'll, I shall go back to it uh, a bit later uh, to uh, briefly uh, refer to its current use. But uh, so essentially, now we are in the early 2000s, and for the first time, the EU Treaty do at least theoretically provide from some uh, legal empowerment of the EU to react either to a threat to the values on which it is based or to an actual persistent serious breach of these values by, by uh, an, any member state. Uh, following this, uh, the, uh, not, not much happened uh, between uh, the Nice Treaty and the early 2010s. 
um, uh, there was a mention of potentially uh, of making use of Article 7 in the context of CIA uh, rendition flights, uh, but to save time, essentially, since so many EU countries were complicit in CIA rendition flights, uh, the, this call for activating Article 7 to EU uh, went nowhere. Uh, fast forwarding to uh, the 2010, when Orban was re-elected Prime Minister of Hungary, this is when essentially uh, what we are now describing as the EU's uh, rule of law crisis began. So uh, the EU has been facing a rule of law crisis now uh, essentially amounting to a total rule of law breakdown in the case of Poland, as Anna will explain. Uh, started in 2010, the first time the European Commission formally acknowledged a new type of threats to the rule of law and the democratic fabric in some of the EU member states was made in 2012. So this uh, rule of law crisis, a democratic and rule of law crisis, has been with us uh, for quite some time and now almost a decade since uh, the Commission under, the, under President Barroso uh, made the diagnosis. So uh, the Commission Barroso, uh, the, the Barroso Commission, uh, as far as I'm concerned, was completely right when he identified a new type of threats uh, to the democratic fabric of some of our uh, European countries. The problem was that the other half of his di the diagnosis uh, made by the Barroso Commission was arguably uh, wrong. At the time in 2012, the Barroso Commission decided against using Article 7, and uh, uh, I'm not going to explain why because we'll have another we'll have a presentation on the situation in Hungary, uh, which led the European Parliament actually to do what the Commission refused to do, which is to activate uh, Article 7 and the, the leadership of our fellow panelists from the Netherlands. Uh, so she will explain, she will give us more detail about this. Um, but essentially, so for the Barroso Commission, Article 7 was not uh, effective enough. He uh, described it as a nuclear option, which was actually uh, legally, uh, factually wrong, uh, but I don't have time to further justify my criticism. Uh, the Barroso Commission also wrongly argued, in my view, that infringement actions, that is the, the procedure uh, enabling the Commission to bring a member state to the Court of Justice when the Commission is of the view that the member state has violated EU law. According to the Barroso Commission, then, um, uh, infringement actions are not uh, effective enough to deal with uh, what can be called democratic and rule of law backsliding. Now, this proved to be wrong a few years later. Uh, but uh, what did the Barroso Commission then do in 2014, instead of actually uh, launching Article 7 and launching many uh, decisive uh, infringement actions? It did uh, launch a few, but uh, uh, then uh, they led to no changes whatsoever, especially uh, in, as regards the situation in Hungary. Then the Barroso Commission came up with this uh, rule of law framework, which was activated for the first time uh, by the Juncker Commission in 2016. Uh, because this uh, rule of law framework was bound to fail from the start, because it was based on the assumption that you, you are dealing with uh, good faith actors when Polish authorities have been anything but. Uh, but then essentially this brings us to 2017 with the Commission uh, using for the very first time Article 7, the preventive arm of Article 7 against Poland. And then the European Parliament uh, did the same uh, in 2018 regarding Hungary. Uh, where are we now? Essentially, if I had to quickly conclude and quickly summarize uh, after 12, almost 12 years of democratic and rule of law backsliding, what have we learned? Essentially, we have learned that the only way to contain uh, the problem is through the, uh, the prompt, uh, uh, meaningful use of the so-called infringement action. I'd be, I'd be delighted to answer questions on uh, what this means, but essentially, uh, Article 7 uh, has proved ineffective, not because Article 7 in and of itself is ineffective, but because the Council has refused to actually make a meaningful use of it. Same regarding the infringement action. Uh, we haven't had enough use of it by the Commission. And in fact, uh, overall, what we have seen in the past uh, 12 years is a tendency from the main EU actors to blame the EU's toolbox uh, for their lack of effective uh, or could I put it for the, the lack of effective answer uh, of um, effective answer to this uh, process of democratic and rule of law uh, backsliding. 
uh, this uh, this obsession with the toolbox uh, actually possibly led to at least uh, the addition of one potentially good effective tool in December 2020, uh, the rule of law conditionality regulation. But as of today, uh, the Commission uh, is refusing uh, to uh, use this latest tool on account that it cannot do so until uh, the pending legal action initiated by the Polish and Hungarian governments is being uh, assessed, uh, ruled on uh, by the Court of Justice, which should be the case in January 2022. So uh, long to finally conclude. Um, after 12 years of rule of law backsliding, the key uh, findings uh, I'd like to draw your attention to is that we have seen too little, uh, too late action from the Commission. We have seen virtually uh, no action, but rather counterproductive action from the Council of Ministers and the European Council, the two intergovernmental institutions. The only uh, two EU institutions which have been uh, playing um, a positive role when it comes to defending EU values are the European Parliament and the Court of Justice of the EU. Uh, sadly, uh, uh, everyone seems now to be waking up, but uh, about uh, 10 years too late. Uh, we have now one EU member state which is no longer a democracy, uh, Hungary, and Poland is about to join suit. I would say on current track, uh, Poland will cease to be a democracy based on the rule of law within the next uh, 24 months. But uh, Anna and Judith are going to tell us uh, more about the situation in Poland and then what the parliament did regarding Hungary. And then obviously I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laurent. I think I have um, some, a question or two for you, but I would really actually like to just go straight to Anna because I think you've set us up really beautifully with this, with the scene of how the rule of law uh, procedures in the EU have evolved and your own opinions on the different institutions, which is really interesting and is a lot of food for thought. But but let's look let's look in detail at some of the countries we're talking about. So if I could pass over to Anna, please, who's going to tell us what's happening in Poland. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so thank you, Laurent, also for this uh, introduction. So Poland joined the uh, rule of law problematic countries in 2015 when the law and justice government started uh, governing. And uh, it is important to note that uh, the idea, the, the art of governance, according to the leader of this party, is that um, the one who governs should constantly probe the limits what uh, the party can get away with uh, on domestic, uh, regional and also international level, including EU level. And this is um, a surprise that was a surprise to many EU institutions that did not react um, fast enough to contain uh, these sort of tendencies. So actually, in the past uh, six years already, almost six years, we have seen that um, the government is um, is trying to implement its plan. The initial plan was presented um, after 2015 and it included uh, first notaring and then politically controlling the constitutional tribunal. And right now, um, in 2021, we have 14 people in the tribunal. There is one vacant seat. And uh, all of them were selected by the parliamentary majority when peace was in power. Um, the court is uh, right now considered widely as not independent, uh, illegally composed, and also operating um, according to some laws that uh, that are not in line with uh, with Polish constitution. And that was uh, not only a view, that is not only a view of uh, scholars or judges that are critical of those changes in Poland, but also of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which found in May this year um, that actually um, the fact that some people who sit in the Constitutional Tribunal illegally uh, breaches the right to fair trial of people who have their cases heard uh, or like constitutional complaints uh, considered there. Um, so secondly, Another element, uh, the key element, institutional element of this crisis it is the National Council of Judiciary. Uh, in Poland, its uh, acronym is KRS. So the problem with this body is that um, it is uh, crucial in the process of appointing judges of common courts and Supreme Court. And uh, 
in 2017, a law was passed that uh, changed the way uh, in which the majority of people who sit in this body are selected. And um, right now, they are selected by parliamentary majority. And in the past, the judges who sit in this council were selected by their peers, by other judges. And this is actually the heart of the problem, because this body recommends people who are then appointed by the president of Poland to common courts at the Supreme Court. And both the EU Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights found in their judgments that uh, such judges cannot constitute a court that is considered independent under the EU law and under the European Convention on Human Rights. Another problem is that the changes in the Supreme Court remain, such as adding two chambers, two new chambers to the whole structure and putting people who were recommended by this KRS uh, in those chambers. And again, we already have judgments from both EU Court and European Convention Court that say that uh, then these, these chambers cannot constitute a proper court according to European standards. So um, the problem is that uh, while the Polish judges today try to implement those judgments passed by ECJ and ECHR, they are being punished. And uh, in the past month uh, alone, six judges were suspended because they, in, they actually acknowledged the judgments of European courts in their decisions. And this uh, is actually the tip of an iceberg because we have judges in Poland who were critical of government or that were applying um, ECJ case law in the past or were passing sentences that uh, were passed in important political cases and its outcome, outcome of these decisions were not um, really positive for, for the ruling party. And these judges were suspended and we have two um, to, to people who are really suffering um, because they have been suspended. These are Judge Paweł Juszczyszyn, who as of today has been suspended for 644 days, and Judge Igor Tuleja, who has been suspended for 356 days already. And this means that their salary is cut, it means that they cannot take any other employment, but they are uh, trying to educate people in Poland about the importance of the rule of law and perform their civic duties. But they are really um, suffering because of also limited action of the European institutions. And another problem is that the prosecution service is completely subordinated to the prosecutor general, who is also the justice minister. And actually, every couple of days, we see examples of discriminatory legalism where the law is being used against the government critics, but it's not used to hold accountable those who are favorable to the government. The other problem with the current rule of law crisis in Poland is that it has been spilling all over Europe. And we have seen this with the execution of the European arrest warrants. Uh, recently, Norway refused to transfer a person to Poland, citing judicial independence concerns. And in the past, courts in Ireland, in the Netherlands, in Germany and in Slovakia cited also such concerns. And the Irish and Dutch courts also asked the ECJ whether they uh, whether the problems uh, of independence of judiciary in Poland are so severe that they should stop sending people to Poland within this procedure at all. And then another part of this like European, I would say, leg of the rule of law crisis right now is this infamous judgment that was passed on October 7 by the Polish Constitutional Tribunal uh, and uh, that was passed on the motion of our Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki. And this judgment including, included a political declaration that the current state of EU integration is a threat to Poland as a sovereign democratic country. And in this decision, crucially, the court rejected parts of ECJ case law regarding the Article 19 of the Treaty of the European Union. And the, some say that this ruling that reignited the debate over the EU law primacy versus national constitutions primacy. But it is untrue, because in fact, this whole judgment was just a small screen uh, or a diversion from real problem, which is the fact that there are structural problems with judicial independence in Poland and judges are suspended, harassed, disciplined, and there are like dubious criminal proceedings started against them. Um, 
And uh, the other problem is also that uh, the Polish government wants to like poison also key institutions that are handing key judgments uh, in cases related to the rule of law crisis in Poland. And these institutions are ECJ and the ECHR. And this year, Poland actually selects people uh, who will, will uh, who, which Polish government hopes that they will become uh, judges of those European courts. And I would like to bring your attention to the fact that, according to my best knowledge, a person who will be presented as a candidate for the European uh, uh, Court of Justice uh, judge is Mr. Um, Rafał Wojciechowski, uh, an expert in ancient Roman law, who has been a judge of the Constitutional Tribunal since beginning of 2020. And importantly, he was also involved in the case, he, he also passed this sentence on October 7, the anti-EU ruling of the Polish Constitutional Court. Um, so um, another like European leg of the problem with the rule of law crisis in Poland is that uh, our um, prosecutor general and the justice minister uh, is not satisfied uh, with the fact that we have challenged uh, the, the primacy of EU law, uh, the EU treaty, but he lodged two motions uh, to the Constitutional Tribunal in which he um, plans to, uh, he asks for verification of a certain interpretation of the Article 6 of European Convention on Human Rights. And this is an act of retaliation against the judgments of the, uh, of the European Court of Human Rights. Actually, one of these judgments were passed yesterday and it concerned one of the chambers in the Supreme Court. So uh, I want to be brief, uh, and maybe we will discuss about some issues later, um, but the, even despite the fact that there are some financial sanctions being discussed against Poland, including fines that were already ordered by the uh, ECJ vice president because Poland refused to implement two important interim orders of the court, uh, one uh, interim order considered a case of a coal mine on the border of Poland and the Czech Republic. And Poland was uh, ordered to pay uh, half a million euros per, per day. Um, and so as of today, Poland needs to pay 25 million euros already. And the clock is ticking. And another case is the case regarding the muzzle law, the law that made the disciplinary regime for judges even harsher, uh, that entered into force in uh, February 2020. And there is an ongoing case in the ECJ. Uh, and the ECJ vice president ordered Poland to pay 1 million euros per day. And the Polish government for some time refused to acknowledge this. And right now, um, well, it, it's not, it's not willing to pay. Well, let's see how it goes. Um, and aside from that, the government uh, discusses certain concessions, discusses concessions that could be made, um, especially that the European Commission is not approving the um, post-pandemic uh, recovery package to Poland. Uh, and this is uh, a package worth 36 billion euros, which is, well, a lot of money. Uh, so uh, the Polish government uh, has promised to uh, to remove, to dissolve the chamber, one of the chambers uh, in uh, the Supreme Court as a subject of dispute with the European Union. But we have not seen any draft regulation on that yet, uh, although it was promised that the, the draft would be presented in um, September or October. Uh, but what we have uh, seen are some uh, draft uh, ideas for further changes into courts in Poland that include the Supreme Court. So. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, no one knows um, if, uh, if those uh, proposals are authentic that circulate among lawyers in Poland. But um, it's it's quite probable because uh, they are basically in line with what the government is saying by uh, by politicians or by uh, spokespeople. And uh, eventually uh, it may end up that uh, this winter we will have another overhaul of the Polish uh, judicial system that would include common courts and crucially the Supreme Court. So there are fears that the Supreme Court will be crippled and made into only two chambers of private and public law. And the Supreme Court judges uh, will be offered either quite luxurious retirement or they 
we will have to go through a procedure of verification, which they may not pass. And if they do not want to go through that, they will be uh, transferred to the courts of appeals. And also another idea is to flatten the court structure in common courts in Poland. So um, I think that my time uh, has passed, uh, so I will be very like, eager to discuss other developments um, afterwards. But I just want to say that uh, even though we are all a little bit maybe tired with the rule of law crisis in Poland, it is absolutely not uh, showing any signs of abating. It is only getting more intense. Um, and I think that uh, it really depends right now on the reaction of European institutions, but also EU member states, uh, media in other countries, um, other governments and civil society across Europe uh, to, to try to contain it finally. Thank you very much, Anna. That's a, a really fantastic introduction to everything that's happening in Poland and, and what might happen in the coming months. Let's turn now to possibly where the Polish government um, took inspiration from, Let's, uh, or at least in how far they could get away with um, uh, the, the challenging the, the rule of law. And let's look at Hungary um, with the reflections of Judith Sargentini, who knows the situation very well. Thank you. Let me try and share video. Okay. Almost there. I come on. Yeah. Um, I hope you hear me. I hope you see me. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Uh, my name is Judith Sargentini. I've been a member of the European Parliament for 10 years and I joined in 2009 and in 2010 um, Viktor Orban was re-elected as Prime Minister. Uh, he had been prime minister uh, earlier and then there was a social democratic government in place and then he got re-elected in 2010 and he immediately started to change laws because he had a two-third majority in the um, uh, in the national parliament and he was able to change the constitution uh, very simply and there, there was a member of the European Parliament who was bragging about the fact that he changed the uh, constitution uh, through um, rewriting it is on his iPad on the weekly flights uh, Budapest, Brussels, Brussels, Budapest. Um, and, and I believe him when he said that. What we saw in the first uh, couple of weeks, a uh, couple of years, were uh, changes in the, particularly in the media freedom. There were laws introduced that talked about um, neutrality of media that basically came down to um, uh, uh, media outlets not being allowed to um, um, report on same-sex marriages, um, gay rights, issues like that, and legislation was put in place and rules were put in place that would lead to self-censorship. Um, media outlets understanding that if they would under overstep the formulated boundaries that were rather vague, they would either get fined or lose out on, um, lose out on state funding and state advertisement. Uh, and that created, that set an atmosphere of a, a completely changed a media atmosphere in the country uh, straight away. We then saw over the years from 2010 to the point that the European Parliament finally had the courage to vote for a so-called Article 7 procedure that Laurent talked about. We saw how the situation changed, how um, the Hungarian government did something that the Polish government never managed to uh, to copy, which is a two-step forward, one-step back approach. So they would take a couple of steps, for instance, uh, um, upping the pension age of, um, of, of judges in such a way that you could renew your whole upper level of judges uh, with people that were more uh, uh, Fidesz, which is the, the ruling party, Fidesz friendly. And then when the council 
the European Court of Justice would step in and say, I know this is, uh, this is beyond uh, what is allowed within the European acquis. Take it one step back, change the law back. But, um, but uh, in practice, things had changed already. Those judges that had to be pensioned early were never reinstated. They might have been reinstated somewhere in a lower court, somewhere in a province, but never on the level they were active at before. So Hungarian government, this was um, step by step, two steps forward, one step back, influenced the media freedom, the academic freedom, the political uh, party space. Um, and then let me touch upon the academic freedom as an example. There, uh, an example that everybody has, uh, well, a, a lot of people have followed. There is one uh, a private university in Budapest that has been very seriously influential in creating a new uh, decision making class in Central and Eastern European and elsewhere in the world. It's a Central European university. That um, university was creating free thinking individuals that took their spot everywhere after the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, in the former Soviet Union, in Central Eastern European and elsewhere. And this was not to the liking of the Fidesz government. But because the Central European University was not only handing out Hungarian um, university degrees, but also American universities degrees, they looked upon it as uh, an international or a non-Hungarian uh, university, and they started to change the law uh, for foreign uh, academic institutions. And it had, this has dragged along for years, where the CEU tried to dance to the uh, music that the Hungarian government was playing and never really could manage to fit within the rules because Actually, and this is basically what's happening all the time, the rules are being changed while the game is on. So uh, not so long ago, the Central European Uni uh, University gave in and moved to Vienna, which is for the first time since the Second World War uh, that, the, um, uh, that, the, that a university in, in, in the European Union had to move because of academic freedom. Um, let me pick up on a so and and I can I can throw you I'll give you one more example on uh, on political freedom close to the elections coming up in April 2018 there was a new law introduced on advertisement for political parties but that law was so vague that it actually let opposition parties to stop using billboards on the side of the streets, which is an important outlet to, to use in your campaign, because uh, Hungary is a, is, a, is, a, is a country where not a lot of, where, where particularly in the rural areas, people are not using the internet. They are depending on TV, public TV broadcasting, and, and, and newspapers, or anything they can see on the street. Rules were changed in such a way that if you would overstep the rules, you would see a huge fine. And that fine could not be paid. So either you would spend your money on this and then after the elections you had to, had to pay back with big fines, or you would just refrain from using the billboards. And if you, if you don't actually have to materialize a law, but you simply put it in place for people to then withdraw their activities, you're already influencing the elections. And this has happened time and time again, various uh, examples. Now, let me pick up on a couple of questions that I saw before, and then I'll try to see what's in the chat. And then uh, Jennifer, let me know whether I'm overstepping my time. Jennifer, when you started introducing, you refer to the fact that a lot of people listening today are in the UK. And the way you put it with the fact that you are living outside of the European Union now after Brexit, it also suggested that the rule of law issue in, uh, in the European Union is far from people. But I'd like to point out that you are still 
you were there when this started and you are still responsible. And one of the, ex not you as a person, uh, not you as a people, but your government played, uh, played a role there. And let me, for instance, take the Fundamental Rights Agency in Vienna, which is the uh, an agency that does um, reporting on you name whatever fundamental rights issues, LGBTIQ, Roma, academic freedom, press freedom, uh, the uh, um, rights of handicapped people, you name it. They could not, they can still not do benchmarks, bring out a report of all the member states on a certain topic benchmarking LGBTIQ rules within all the member states. And one of the reasons why that is not possible is because the conservative UK government stopped it. And every couple of years, when the Fundamental Rights Agency had to review its its position and had to bring in its new annual uh, uh, multi-year um, uh, plans, it was the UK government backed up by my own Dutch government, but the UK government was in the lead, stopping this kind of comparison and stopping the fundamental rights agency to have its own say. Or uh, the other thing that I wanted to clarify, the vote on my report, Article 7 report, in the European Parliament needed a third majority. And that is an awful lot. And I I would, why have we, we delayed the, the, the report for the vote until after that Hungarian election I just referred to in April 2018, because I was sure that we would never get the biggest group in the European Parliament, the European People's Party, the Christian Democrats, to vote with us on the report until after Fidesz, a member of the Christian Democrats, um, had, had won the elections. But when we finally came to the vote, and it was a sequence of votes over the years, it was the, uh, the, it were the British Conservatives not backing us up because there was only one friend left over in the council for Theresa May at that point that was negotiating Brexit, and that was Viktor Orban. So Theresa May made it very clear to her flock in the European Parliament that they were not to vote for a, um, for my report that was simply highlighting all the rule of law issues uh, uh, going on in, in Hungary. Um, somebody asked earlier what the end game is of rule of law. There is no end game. This is politics and this is European Union politics. And like Viktor Orban taking two steps forward, one step back, that's also what the European system does. Um, we, where if you take your tennis club, the tennis club has a constitution or a set of rules for when things go bad. Uh, you never care about the, the, the rules when everything is dandy, but when things go bad, you go back to the starting document and you figure out how do we solve this, what is our rights. The union doesn't have that. The union has a lot of rules, but not for when things go wrong. Because when things go wrong, it's a political union where there are political, where there are countries that are not willing to be strict towards each other that think if I do this to you, uh, you'll do it to me, so I refrain from action. This is why it took so very long before we finally had the process on Hungary going, because the member states hoped this would solve itself, or they said the European Commission is the, is the guardian of the treaties, where well, that is quite impossible because the European Commission is a mixture between politicians and um and civil servants these commission are not elected but they're appointed by their member states and they represent a member state and a political group and they do not have a, they do not have a mandate beyond that particular mandate so there is no end game there's just modeling on 
Somebody also asked about the European of the Council of Ministers or the European Council and whether that's not where the real power lies. Yes, but also no. The fact that the report that I wrote had been had been voted on with a two third majority, which was something that we was a really I couldn't predict whether we would make it during that vote or not, actually made an awful lot of change because it put pressure on the council. It put pressure on them that had not been there. And as this is not a court case, but it is politics where people care about the pressure that is put upon, upon them, that there is indeed, it's the council that is slow in its reforms, but they're also moving. Um, um, somebody asked and, and then help me. I'll answer one more question, Hello. Jennifer, and then you'll help me. Um, somebody asked about the role of Angela Merkel and Germany in this debate around Hungary. Uh, and whether Angela Merkel had been actually softening or have been protecting the government in Hungary. And yes, I think she did. And she did for a couple of reasons. Her, her counterpart, her, her, her family, her, her, you've got two Christian Democratic parties in Germany. CDU of Angela Merkel and the sister party CSU in Bavaria, which is very close to the Hungarian government. And the German automotive industry, industry is very dependent on the laborers in the Hungarian, uh, in, in Hungary. Next to that, it is her method to always try to bring consensus and to continue talking and not act um, uh, forcefully, particularly uh, looking at the background of the country and how large the country is. So yes, I think Angela Merkel delayed uh, proper European um, proper European um, um, movement towards Hungary, um, but she probably also softened the blow for a lot of people. Thank you, Jennifer. Mm. Well, thank you, Judith. I found that really interesting, especially someone who reported on the Article 7 procedure that your report launched in the European Parliament and, and reported on the British Conservatives voting against that as well. I, I just wanted to come back to one of the points you've made about my um, analogy, because I, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to suggest that the UK government was or should be far away from the rule of law issue in the European Union. But rather, just what, what the point I wanted to make was that I think that Article, Article 50 procedure is, a, in fact, easier to deal with than an Article 7 procedure, if we want to put it in treaty terms. So I think a country can leave the European Union, or at least a country on the, geographically on the periphery can leave the European Union, and the European Union can continue. But, but can, how can the European Union tr truly uh, survive intact if you have countries one after the other that don't have independent judges we sort of the whole sort of basis of the treaty is that if you're a german car maker you can open a factory in hungary and you you can be assured that the rule of law is as good in hungary as it is in in germany and once you well, start it's not to, anymore well once indeed but once you that's my the point i wanted to make is once you start to unpick the rule of law you start to unpick the foundations of the european union in a way that i don't think you do when you when a country leaves so that was the point I wanted to, to make. And also on the British government, I think it's just interesting to note that um, last week, Boris Johnson had a call with um, Morawiecki. And, uh, and in the official readout of that call that we had from Downing Street, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson underlined his concerns about the role of the European Court of Justice in Northern Ireland, again, talking about Brexit. But he also noted the debate in Poland about the role of the court too. So I'm quoting from that Downing Street press release. So I thought it was interesting that the British Prime Minister is linking the the, the UK complaint about um, the European Court of Justice with Poland's uh, complaint about the EU legal system. And that's certainly, I think, an, an intervention that raised a lot of eyebrows about what exactly the British government was doing in, in making that link. But I do, yeah. I do want to... 
some of our, I, we'll maybe come back to that point in a little while, but I just, I do want to bring in our other speakers as well um, on, on some of these really excellent questions that we've got coming along. And I wanted to go, if I may, to Laurent first, um, because the very first question was for him, but I also had one myself, which is quite related. And I, and I suppose the, the question also touches on what Judith was talking about just now. Uh, and my question, I suppose, or my point would be, could you could you make a sort of well, I'd like to make an in defense of the European Council or for, you know, to play the devil's advocate. Someone's got to defend the European Council or the Council of Ministers, because, Laurent, you said uh, earlier that um, the, the, there have been no action or only counterproductive action from the European Council or the or Council of Ministers. But I think you could you not also say that Article 7 is just not a very effective tool. Uh, in any sense, and that Article 7 was only really designed to have one black sheep country. Um, and But if you have two, where if you have Poland and Hungary together and they can protect each other, then Article 7 doesn't work. You can't, um, Poland will protect Hungary, Hungary will protect Poland. And, and so the European Council, the Council of Ministers is simply in a bind that it's unable to to take any action you can start the article 7 procedure but you can't finish it and then i with that point in mind to you i just wanted to pick up the question of um so say makaradze I, I hope i pronounced that well and he also had a, a question or comment about the european council which he said is crucial for enacting any kind of measure um that the parliament or commission can develop and and he said the last rule of law conditionality regulation negotiation showed the real problem of deadlock decision making in the EU. Therefore, do you not think that if one needs to do something, it should be addressed to the council decision making? And the, the question continues. Um, so do you not see the necessity that member states in the council that are concerned with the faith of the rule of law should put more pressure on the on the recalcitrant member states? So I wonder if Laurent, maybe I could bring in you to just address these points on the on the European Council. Hopefully yours. Uh, yes. Uh, so yeah. thank you, Jennifer. And uh, also just uh, to uh, start, uh, I'd like to just express my agreement with your diagnosis. Uh, democratic and rule of law backsliding is way more threatening to the survival of the EU than any uh, member state uh, withdrawing from it. This is something I actually wrote in 2016 at the start of uh, the Brexit process. And only last week, uh, the president of the European Court of Justice, I think it's very worth, it's worth stressing uh, uh, before I answer your questions, for the very first time uh, delivered the, the bleakest, uh, the most dramatic assessment I've ever heard from the president of uh, any European supranational court, that is either the Court of Justice or the European Court of Human Rights. He spoke um, he said it's no exaggeration that um, the EU's foundation as a union based on the rule of law are under threat and the, that the very survival of the European project in its current form is at stake. I mean, you cannot be bleaker, more dramatic for some, uh, and this is coming from someone who's usually very soft spoken and the president of the European Court of Justice. So um, the situation is dire. And uh, why is so threatening to the EU legal order uh, in light of the current situation is that the e, we, what we're seeing is um, the autocratic uh, gangrenization of the EU system. And this is something which is going to really uh, threaten the very survival of the EU's legal order as we know it. Now, just to go back to your question, I mean, to your many questions. So, yes, I did uh, say that the Council of the EU and the European Council essentially have done uh, what they've done was uh, mostly counterproductive. I stand by my answer. Uh, in fact, what I forgot to say is that also they have uh, served us with some facade of action. So it's not simply they've been uh, counterproductive in what they've done. Uh, sometimes they're just pretending to be acting. And here I'm thinking of the tool the Council created in 2014, which is known as the Annual Rule of Law Dialogue. Uh, I'm sure you have not heard of it. I mean, most of you have not heard of it, and for good reasons, because it is completely uh, ineffective. Um, now, uh, you asked me about Article 7. So it's a difficult question to briefly, quickly answer, but uh, I, would I would be tempted to say a bad workman always uh, blames his tool for the bad work he's doing. 
And this is very much what's happening with Article 7. Uh, essentially, uh, everyone is happy to blame Article 7 to hide their own lack of action, meaningful action, and in some circumstances, their active complicity in enabling autocrats uh, in Warsaw and Budapest. And here I'm thinking of Merkel especially. So Article 7 in and of itself is not uh, completely uh, ineffective. Yes, you have very high decision-making thresholds. That being said, a lot can be done within the framework of uh, the current Article 7. You can have uh, one hearing every six months, and you can do that uh, in a very transparent way. Uh, to this date, I have to systematically ask for the minutes of each Article 7 hearing. It's not public. We don't know uh, which questions are being asked by whom. There is a total lack of transparency. Uh, the Council has devised Article 7 hearings in the most ineffective and least transparent way they could have come up with. And this is not a necessary logical con consequence from Article 7. So no, I don't agree that Article 7 itself is ineffective by nature. It has been made ineffective by the Council. Um, um, you asked me many questions, but I would say perhaps um, regarding EU member states uh, in the Council and also outside of the Council. Uh, there is a tendency for uh, the pro rule of law national governments, including France and Germany, uh, to hide behind the Commission. So saying, well, we can discuss the rule of law, but really this is not where action must uh, take place. Uh, it's for the guardian of the treaties. And then we have a bit of a chicken and egg situation because the Commission then in turn say, no, we, we're not going to act. We're not going to act uh, meaningfully, decisively as a guardian of the treaty unless we get political backing from the European Council slash uh, Council of the EU. But sadly, uh, the European Council is where the rule of law goes to die. Uh, as I've often said, essentially, the European Council, the DNA of the European Council is uh, consensus and very polite conversation. They seem, they seem completely unable and unwilling for a number of reasons uh, to confront their peers, even when their peers are completely openly destroying the rule of law, including by openly violating judgments of the Court of Justice. So I would say uh, to uh, get out of this uh, uh, vicious circle, we need the national parliaments uh, to actually raise rule of law, uh, uh, EU, EU rule of law related issues uh, uh, at the national level. We have to make it more costly. We have to make uh, the rule of law more salient in each of the EU member states to force national governments to act more meaningfully in the council. But technically, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the EU treaties has established the Commission as a guardian of the treaty. So the Commission is wrong to wait for political backing from the Council and European Council. That's not how the EU treaties were designed. Uh, the EU treaties were designed to insulate the Commission from this kind of a political calculus. Uh, as a guardian of the treaty, the Commission has full discretion. Uh, but uh, the Commission has waited and waited years before actually launching infringement actions. And infringement actions, as we have seen in the case of Poland, They've been the only um, effective means to actually contain rule of law backsliding. I'm not saying that legal actions are going to solve the, are going to solve the day, but they are very effective in containing the damage and making it both legally, politically, and actually economically uh, costly when you stop complying with judgments of the Court of Justice. So uh, no, Article 7 is not ineffective. No infringement actions can be effective. Uh, yes, uh, the Council and the European Council have been completely underwhelming, in fact, if not counterproductive when it comes to defending the rule of law, including through some facet of action and meaningless tools like uh, the Council uh, annual rule of law dialogue. I try to answer all of them together, but it's not easy. Thanks. It was a big, a big set of questions for you. For you. There's, there's a very interesting question I have, I see in the chat for Anna, which I would like to know the answer to. Um, well, I'm going to put it to Anna, but uh, a question from Alexander Mesarovic. Uh, to what extent do you think these parties and governments are learning from each other? And I wonder, Anna, how you would see that in the Polish context. Do you think that uh, law and justice took some inspiration at all from Fidesz, from Viktor Orban? I mean, they different different contexts in different countries, but then was there a sense of looking at what Victor Orban had done and what was able to get away with that maybe encouraged the, the ruling party in Poland when they came to power in, in 2015? Or, or do you think they were really acting quite on, independently on, on their own terms? 
Well, I think that they took some inspiration, but then they adapted it to the circumstances in Poland and actually went way beyond uh, of what go- uh, the Orban's government achieved in Hungary in relation to the judicial independence and the rule of law. Uh, so the problems are quite different. Uh, in Hungary, there is more of this informal power and entrenched corruption in the mafia state, whereas in Poland, this is also something that we fear that may be happening, uh, especially uh, given that the circles of the Prime Minister Morawiecki, Justice Minister Ziobro, are people who would rather like to enrich themselves and create this new um, political and economic allied. Um, and I think that, of course, um, it uh, was to Kaczynski's advantage that the European Union institutions at the very beginning did not react forcefully to what was happening in Hungary. And that provided some hope, I think, for the Polish leadership that it will continue like this also in the case of Poland. And then um, Kaczynski announced his plan to, to bring Budapest and Warsaw closer many years before um, but for many years, this plan sounded like, um, like I would say, a, a crazy, outrageous idea in the Polish political life because um, it it seemed that most Poles would rather continue this path of development and um, democratization. But actually, um, it is quite uh, right now popular among uh, the land justice electorate, this idea of uh, rapprochement of uh, Budapest and uh, and Warsaw. But it's morally, it's, I think it's more symbolic and ideological than in, in, uh, in exact terms, I would not count Hungary as the principal ally or economic partner of Poland at all. So actually, this is only, I would say, a comparison between Poland and Hungary that is often made, especially often made when made from, let's say, the United States or perhaps also from the UK. But in reality, right now, in my opinion, Kaczynski's government, Morawiecki's go- government is going uh, on their own path. And they are creating new problems. So they, in a way, did something that Orban has never dared, including um, putting cases in the constitutional tribunal that would challenge the supremacy of EU law or the European Convention on Human Rights, and also being so um, so aggressive um, towards judges and uh, and parts of civil society. Uh, of course, Orban is also aggressive and. Um, and it, he demonstrated that against minorities, etc. But actually, he was uh, at least successful in in convincing judges to to be more uh, complacent or silent on these issues. Mm-hmm. There is a perception yeah. in Brussels among officials that, um, or at least among some, that the Polish government does not handle the rule of law conflict with the EU as smartly as Viktor Orban did or does. And that Morawiecki has rather backed himself into a corner now with the recovery fund um, standoff and also with this, the, the really directly taking on the EU's legal order with the, with the recent case that he, he took to the, to the court, which found, of course, in, in exactly the verdict that I, that I imagine he wanted that, uh, that, uh, the constitu- Polish constitution is said not to is said to be in conflict or is said to be there is no supremacy of EU law according to that that verdict. But there, and there's a, a view that Viktor Orban would not have allowed himself to be in that situation as Judith talked about. You know, two steps forward, one step back, and the Polish approach seems quite different in in that regard. I, I mean, is that a is that an analysis you would agree with in any sense? And I if, I just, if I could just tack on one one of the questions from the chat as well, which I think is interesting. Um, Christopher Cooper is asking about, you know, how does the EU move forward with with this with this crisis? I mean, in in, in a Polish context, what should the EU be doing? Mm-hmm. So I only disagree with uh, with uh, an opinion that uh, this crisis is dangerous to the government in Poland because it's not necessarily dangerous to them. So if, uh, for them, it's beneficial. Actually, the uh, the idea is that the, they are now protecting Poland, which is being um, attacked on both sides uh, from the West uh, by the European Union and Germany, of course, even if Germany is silent on the rule of law issues most of the time. Then in the uh, South, we have the Czechs, so our southern enemy, so who is also using this uh, EU Court of Justice. And right now we have this a crisis on the border with Belarus. So I know that it's when we look at it, um, if we look at politics in a more sensible way, we would see that Poland has really um, squandered the time uh, and the opportunity to become a really powerful EU member state. 
but this uh, ruling by creating so many conflicts and division lines is how Kaczynski is actually governing its own his own party and uh, Poland and um, and the governing coalition. So for him, this is I think the idea how you should carry out politics, and it also is attractive to some parts of electorate in Poland. And Kaczynski only thinks about winning at next elections. So for that, he needs of course votes of uh, of some fringe. Mm -hmm. Um, parts of electorate and to them this idea that you can be tough on the European Union, you can tease Brussels, you can try to do some things that are not really rational, um, it can be attractive and of course there are limits to that which is the money and I think that uh, the EU has only one leverage and this is um, not approving the national recovery plan because Poland will probably disregard any fines, any small fines, such as the fines regarding this uh, Turów coal mine, uh, which amount to uh, 25 million euros. But the uh, recovery plan is 36 billion, and this is already um, spent, uh, in theory, on certain uh, economic develop development programs um, under the name of the Polish deal. So I think that the the only way to stop to stop or to to have some demands that would be actually um, answered um, is to push on um, on on this uh, money aspect. So that's really the EU's best move to deal with the rule of law crisis in Poland is really to put use that financial lever and deny Poland the 36 billion. And then potentially, I think, I mean, before, well. it, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm, I mean, uh, the infringement actions they were successful in a way that then they stopped or slowed down certain processes, but were, they were not effective in a way that they didn't make a, an impression uh, on the government. And government still plans to 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 do disguise the further reforms under some sort of credible changes into courts. And actually, I think that. Um, we've seen it with anti-LGBT resolutions that were passed by some municipalities in Poland that actually it was the EU money pressure or the, the specter of this withholding of EU funds that were promised that made people and also peace politicians to change their minds and even uh, vote uh, to withdraw the resolutions against their beliefs and against the ideology. So I think that this is a, some sort of very... Uh, clientelistic and also very money-oriented pragmatic approach uh, that um, at the end of the day when we are faced with um, the prospect of no EU funds at all, that would be problematic for, for the voters of the Land Justice Party. Mm. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. And can I, can I bring in Judith on, on this point? Do you, do you also see, I mean, is, is money the lever that the Commission should be using when it comes to Hungary as well. Of course, you also don't have their recovery plan approved yet. I mean, just just to go back to that broader question of what's how does the EU move forward in in dealing with with the rule of law crisis in Hungary, and and do you agree with Anna that that money could be a very important lever? I mean, we think of also that Viktor Orban, its family is is has benefited from EU funds in quite a spectacular way. If we think of the his son-in-law had a um, a, a contract uh, to supply, or won a contract to supply street lighting that was uh, funded through EU funds that then the EU's anti-fraud office sub subsequently looked into. So there's a long and complicated story there. But I mean, again, is is funding the lever that the Commission should be should be going for in order to manage this crisis? Yes, it is for both countries. Um, what did both governments did well? And that is bread and butter for their people. Um, in Hung in Poland, has has been child support, and in Hungary, it's been a similar thing. And if you were living on um, in a rural area or low salary, child support in Poland has made a huge difference, and it actually has given people back their dignity. So I, I completely understand why people would vote for that. Uh, but that is, at a certain point, probably not affordable anymore. And you could actually blame the governments before peace and before Fidesz for not having a proper lookout on the needs of their society. And if uh, governments are providing that, then of course they 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 have they, they they start off with the benefit of the doubt or even more than that. 
So yes, money is what makes it tick. And also both countries, both cit citizens from both countries, they don't want to leave the European Union. Oh. Earlier, there was a question on Article 50 and, uh, and that that would be the easier solution. Yes, it is. But it is if you want to leave. And whereas Hungarian and, and, and Polish citizens, um, uh, uh, contrary, I would say, to the Brits for some reason, they... They, they cherish the freedom of movement and they cherish what comes with European freedoms. But do we have the leverage within the council to really act? The fact that the commission is sitting on that, on that funding for the recovery after COVID is a real nice bold step. And it means they feel supported by part of the council, which until recently they did not. And European decision making within the Council is on a majority basis or or on a, on a consensus basis, and that cannot be created here because there are simply too many other countries that understand what Hungary and Poland are doing. I saw a question somebody asking whether uh, Hungary is setting a trend in the Balkans and they're influencing there. I would say so, yes. I don't know whether you recall this story that you could simply not imagine yourself. In 2018, a couple of days before a former prime minister in Macedonia, what is now northern Macedonia, had to go to jail for serious corruption charges, Mr. Krievsky. Before a couple of days before he had to jail, had to go to jail for corruption, he disappeared from the country. And then he showed up again in Budapest because the Hungarian uh, Secret Service helped him by car out from Macedonia via Albania and Montenegro all the way up to Hungary. And they gave him asylum in a country that where nobody gets asylum. And if you would apply for asylum, asylum, you'd be locked up on the border with Serbia. This prime minister, with jail time, got asylum in Hungary. And why? Because it was a Christian Democratic family member and the Macedonian Social Democratic government went after him and Budapest stopped it. And we've seen movements in Slovenia. We see what's happening in Croatia. Uh, we. So, yes, we, we see a huge influence within the Union and outside of the Union. And this is this this illiberal um, approach is contagious. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. And, and I'm, I'm really glad you picked up that really interesting question on, on the Balkans. And, and now that we have sort of broadened out to other countries, let me pick up a question that Dionysus has put at the bottom of the the chat and he's we also have uh, as well some helpful links including to the the um this the head of the ecj speech that um that laurent was referring to earlier but laurent can i can i put you to you the question that Giannis has asked in the chat which is to what extent if at all do you agree with those who say that there is an emerging rule of law crisis in the uk as well uh yes um uh, there is uh, an emerging um pattern whereby essentially the UK seems to be undergoing a process of democratic and rule of law backsliding. So yes, I agree with those uh, who've been warning about what I have called, in fact, the urbanization of the UK under Boris Johnson. So if you look at uh, the way uh, democracy and rule of law have been undermined in Hungary and uh, and Poland, and then you apply this uh, the ingredients of what I have called a constitutional capture, and then you can see plenty of uh, common features. Uh, I'm not saying that we are yet there, but it's important to be aware of the pattern uh, which is uh, grow developing under Boris Johnson. Attacks on judges. Uh, it began essentially from my point of view when uh, some judges were described as enemies of the people. So that was, uh, from my point of view, the beginning of the process of democratic and rule of law backsliding, which uh, essentially Brexit perhaps inadvertently uh, as uh, created. Uh, so we are not uh, obviously yet in a position uh, where um, 
uh, judicial independence has been significantly undermined, but uh, we are getting there with some reforms of judicial review, some threats made against the Supreme Court, some uh, completely unfunded accusations of judicial activism. At the same time, we also we also seeing some evidence of industrial scale corruption, which is another one of the key features of Orbán's mafia state. So whenever you see democratic and rule of law backsliding, another aspect is then corruption goes uh, completely unpunished. Um, there is also a very significant lack of any prosecution in the UK, which is quite uh, troubling in the face of uh, mounting evidence of, I would say, potential uh, credible allegations of misuse of public money. Uh, and in both Hungary and Poland, the first thing uh, the autocrat did was to control directly or indirectly uh, the prosecutor's office. So I'm just saying we need to worry uh, about uh, what's happening in the UK. Uh, I would say we are perhaps uh, where Hungary was in 2011 uh, after Orban was re-elected in 2010. Uh, so even though obviously a different history, different traditions, different systems, but uh, the UK is in a very weak position, if only to the extent uh, that uh, rule of law is mostly based on unwritten social conventions. In the, I'm not saying that it's uh, perfect to have a, a written codified uh, constitutional text with a, a strong constitutional court, but then the damage can actually be delayed. Uh, if it wasn't for also, um, uh, so for instance, thanks to the Polish Constitutional Court, before it was un unconstitutionally captured, then uh, we had about uh, 15 months of uh, delay before uh, the destruction of judicial independence began. Uh, there are less uh, constraints, in fact, in the UK when it comes to democratic and rule of law backsliding. In fact, we used to talk about the dictatorship of the executive in the UK as early as the 1970s. So yes, uh, I'm, I'm very worried about the situation in the UK uh, to conclude on this point. Okay, and far be it from me to be a, a defender of the British government, but just as a counter argument, I would put that the, the, certainly the UK judges are, seem to me to be in a robust state of health and that the, we, we saw the Supreme Court, court verdict um, on, um, on, uh, on, on, on Brexit a few years ago that really showed the independence of the court and you, you mentioned the enemies of the people headline which was of course from a newspaper rather than a government policy although I note that the government was not very quick to defend the judges um, but not at all yes. it's, um, they, they felt the then uh, the attorney general of the day refused to actually defend yes. uh, judicial independence and the judges in breach of a uh, statutory of I mm -hmm. would add but I, I don't want to, to make this purely now to, into a, a debate on the UK because there's a let me just put one more question to you and then I'll go back to the others. But because there's another question in the, the, the chat that I think is interesting. But where do you draw the line between uh, being a rule of law space and not being a democracy? And you, you said something that quite struck me as well, which also struck our one of our um, what, questioners here. That what do you expect the marker for Poland to be? Because you said earlier it would not be a democracy within the next 24 months, which was very precise. I mean, yes. when does it cross that uh, that point? I mean, yeah, I said within the next 12 to 24 months. So essentially I was basing my diagnosis or assessment on the work and data uh, done by other democracy and rule of law experts. In, the, uh, in this context, I was referring indirectly or implicitly to the annual democracy report of uh, a network of democracy experts known as VDEM. So that's, I can, uh, I'll add the, the link in the chat. So they define democracy on the basis of a number of uh, principles, core components, and then uh, they on this, on the basis of these core components, uh, they collect data, both of a quantitative and a qualitative nature. And then uh, based on their assessment, Hungary and Poland are uh, the top two countries in terms of dismantling uh, democratic uh, checks and balances in the world. So according to this democracy expert, Hungary ceased to be a democracy in 2019 based on their data. Uh, when it comes to Poland, Poland has been uh, downgraded from liberal democracy to electoral democracy, uh, but is on track to becoming the EU second, second authoritarian or autocratic electoral autocracy, according to VDM experts. 
So you just have to look at the, uh, the medium to long-term trends, and then it's quite uh, clear. It's not simply then uh, the VDM experts, but if you look at all the rule of law and democracy indexes, then uh, both Poland and Hungary have been uh, backsliding uh, quite dramatically, uh, in, and this uh, process of backsliding has been accelerating. So there is not like a specific one uh, smoking gun or one uh, specific threshold. It's a spectrum, it's a pattern. So you have to look at the overall trends over a period of time to see uh, where a country is moving. So in the case of Hungary, uh, not all, I would say most, uh, if not uh, all of the democracy experts uh, no longer viewed uh, Hungary as a democracy as defined and understood uh, by uh, democracy experts. When it comes to the rule of law, uh, is there a specific point? No, even though um, in the case of the, I was mentioning the president of the European Court of Justice, for the first time last week, he spoke of uh, specific red lines, which once you cross uh, these red lines, essentially uh, you have um, you have put yourself outside of the realm of what is acceptable allowed uh, as part of EU membership. In the case of Poland, uh, an EU Advocate General has used the expression. It didn't directly say, uh, didn't directly state that Poland uh, was a legal black hole but it did warn explicitly for the very first time about the emergence of legal black holes in the EU. And essentially what he meant by that, a system where the minimum requirements when it comes to the principle of separation of powers between the executive slash legislature and the judiciary are no longer respected. According to the EU Advocate General, for instance, in the case of um, certain judges, uh, there are no, Polish authorities have essentially undermined the minimum requirements when it comes to a presumption of innocence. So uh, is there a specific point at which point uh, Poland can be said to be no longer a law-abiding system? It's difficult to pinpoint. Uh, however, we are reaching a stage where now, essentially, according to both the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights, the Constitutional Tribunal of Poland is no longer a tribunal properly understood, so it's uh, a, a puppet body. He has been described as a puppet at the Constitutional Tribunal, but essentially this is no longer a court, according to the European Court of Human Rights. Supreme Court of Poland is no longer a court, also according to the European Court of Human Rights. Um, a number of uh, judges appointed uh, post-2018, essentially, uh, according to a judgment issue last uh, uh, yesterday, actually, by the European Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Human Rights expressed essentially to oversimplify uh, serious concerns about whether there are in fact uh, lawful judges able to adjudicate without violating uh, the right to a fair trial guaranteed in the, EC, uh, in the European Convention on Human Rights. In fact, we've been talking about the EU's rule of law crisis, but one important point maybe I should make to conclude that the EU's rule of law crisis is also a rule of law crisis of the Council of Europe. Uh, Poland and Hungary are obviously members of the Council of Europe, and it's for the very first time Poland has become the first EU member state to be both subject at the same time to the special monitoring process of the EU, Article 7, and the special monitoring process of the Council of Europe. This is the very first time an EU member state has been essentially identified as creating a systemic threat to the rule of law under not only the EU system, under the EU system, but also under the Council of Europe. So the situation is dire, not only from an EU law point of view, but also from the point of view of the European Con Convention on Human Rights. I would say that if things um, uh, on the current on current track, I would say we could end up with thousands, ten of thousands of complaints directed at Polish authorities. Um, on the basis of the unlawful judicial appointments uh, they keep uh, making since 2018. So in fact, uh, not only is the EU being put under threat by what's happening in Poland, but they are actually seriously undermining the functioning of the ECHR uh, system as well. So it's going to, and I'm afraid it's going to get worse before it gets better, as Anna was saying, because of a number of uh, political short-term uh, incentives. Thank you. Thank you, and, and, and for reminding us, of, especially of that this is not just an issue for the European Union, but Europe in the, in the broadest sense. But we'll, we'll be coming to take our final round soon of questions. So do do chip in now if you if you want if you have any final questions or comments. But before we take that final round, let me come to Anna briefly, just to just to see if, she, if 
I'd like to see if you have any reflections on the timeline that was that was put out put forward and by um, um, uh, by Laurent, um, because you talked about the, uh, the overhaul of the Supreme Court that is on the way. I mean, do you see that Poland is going to pass a point of no longer being a fully functioning democracy soon, or, or has it already passed that point? And could you also pick up the question that somebody posed earlier in the chat about, do you think Poland will use the the um, the current uh, Belarusian and migration situation to try and distract attention from the rule of law? Um, government is definitely using the current crisis to distract the attention from the rule of law domestically, and it works. And actually, the government has many problems to deal with. And um, in, re in a recent poll, um, one third of polls consider that the biggest threat to Poland today is actually the conflict with the European Union. On the second place, there was um, the migration crisis, and on the third place, uh, rising food prices. Or general prices. So um, without the crisis on the eastern border, it would be much more difficult for the law and justice to perform so well in the polls. And um, on the question of whether Poland is a dem democratic country, um, well, of course, the, the simplest test is uh, usually elections. Uh, so elections, as in Hungary, would be probably uh, free, but not necessarily fair because of limitations to the freedom of uh, media and to media pluralism. And this is uh, another major uh, concern uh, of people who are watching democracy today. Um, also, if uh, the government manages to overhaul the Supreme Court, it is the Supreme Court that decides on election results. And uh, we will have to count on the integrity of people who will remain in the Supreme Court. And we don't know really how much, how many people can actually be there because the regulations may entail that this Supreme Court would be really, really small. Um, and then, um, well, I think that people in Poland uh, are a little bit tired of the rule of law crisis and it has become so much uh, conflated with grand politics, um, grand um, discussions on the EU level. And in a way, uh, the Polish um, government was successful in elevating it to this European law conflict with the con uh, conflict with the constitution and the EU law primacy point. But what I think is the most important for Poles, like in their everyday life, is that the other elements that constitute the rule of law in Poland are not working. And right now we are at this moment where the government is putting so much pressure on civil servants on the police, on doctors who cannot, for instance, perform medical procedures because of the restriction of abortion law made by the Constitutional Tribunal, and uh, also on people who are guarding right now the borders. So I think that m more and more groups in Poland are really seeing that this government is limiting the rights and freedoms. And this is something more visceral and uh, impacting daily life than uh, changes in the Constitutional Tribunal that most people do not understand or actually they treat it as an entertainment. So I think that if uh, there is a chance for uh, for Poles to actually change the government, it will um, stem not from um, the ECJ, but rather from the fact that, uh, that the government will put so much pressure and make so many social groups life miserable or people will just fear that they cannot trust in their doctors, in their um, in, in the police, that they will uh, say that this is enough. So this is this is so this is my prediction. So I think that yes, the quality of uh, democratic governance um, will be limited, and also the rights of freedoms will be limited, um, not only legally but also we will feel it uh, in our daily lives. And then there will be maybe a point. If there will be free elections, the polls may change this this government. Thank you. Very very sobering, and but also with some some hope there as well. Let, we'll take a final round of um, questions and comments now. So if I could ask all our speakers to think about the final points you might want to say, and that we'll go in reverse order. And if I may start with Judith, I wanted to to put that final question, one of the questions to you about how do you how to ensure the decisions 
made in the EU institutions are not shaped by party loyalty. So how to ensure that we don't have an, uh, a Fidesz EPP problem again in the future. And then more broadly, perhaps as a final sort of wrapping up, could I ask you to reflect on, do you think that now the EU has got to grips with the rule of law crisis, when we look at the, the Commission sitting on the recovery funds, when we look at, um, or at least when we look at the vibrancy of civil society in, in Hungary, in Poland, do you think now that the tide is beginning to turn, that there are reasons to be, to be hopeful, to be optimistic? So on your first, thank you, Jennifer, on your first question, uh, how to not make party politics part of the equation, you can't. But European politics is politics like every other politics. And if I would say how to not make party politics part of the equation in, uh, or in, uh, in the House of Commons, you would laugh at me. So no, it's, it's not going to happen. So we need to, we, we need to make politicians accountable for what they're doing and change the form of party politics. It's very painful to see that. Um, when I started in 2009, one of the first things that I did was trying to get something going on uh, media independence around Italy, where at that point Berlusconi was the prime minister, but still owned his own media conglomerate. And uh, that was blocked with a couple of votes because of EPP, uh, because uh, the European People's Party, because they were saying you're going after a member state and you can't do that. But that's not the case. So it is about the form of party politics. Are we willing to criticize ourselves? But you can't take it out of the equation because then you would take politics out of the equation. Uh, do I, am I hopeful? It's, it's people that need to liberate themselves. So what we're doing, I would say, what one, one is doing on a Brussels level is trying to continuously put the um, put possibilities in, uh, yeah, in place for citizens to act. And the vote on my report uh, over two years ago has been one of those moments that that, that citizens citizens in Hungary saw were not alone. The fact that they're now gearing up towards the gov uh, towards the new elections with a uh, combined opposition might be a very good sign. I'm not sure because if the idea is the enemy of my enemy is my friend, then you don't know how successful they're going to be. But change needs to come from within and we can only provide uh, support from the outside. And if um, if people are continue to be happy or OK with the situation, change is not going not going to come. So no, it's not an uplifting story, but I do believe that people are at a certain point are ready for, for change because they see they're being joked at. Mm. Thank you. And I want to put much the same question to you. To you. Do you think um, that the situation is at a tipping point in, in Poland? I mean, you, you were actually you were talking on this on this point a, a moment ago. But for example, today I I met some some Polish lawyers who are defending judges throughout Poland who have been very active in promoting the rule of law through videos and through very clever ways on on social media. And they said, well, if we hadn't done this, we would be like Belarus now. So I wonder just how, how do you see the um the, the future for Poland do you think we are at a turning point um well uh I still I'm still an optimist and of course I uh, applaud the work that the free course initiative uh, has been doing for so many years and it is true that without the civil society without judges who are really brave and they are um very um committed to defending the values um they do not fear, I think, that much the, the, the consequences that may fall upon them because there is a lot of solidarity within the judicial community in Poland. And this also applies to other professions such as um, barristers or, or some independent prosecutors. Um, so in the long term, I think that the Poland is not yet lost, obviously, and Poland will be democratic 
Um, but we will have to deal with the fact that there is this, a significant proportion of electorate that accepts non-democratic practices when it is compensated with something uh, that this that such voters find acceptable, attractive. And uh, and I think that liberals in Poland have a big problem with um, understanding the um, the feelings that, um, that uh, the right wing populists actually. Um, understand much better um, many fears that are uh, in the Polish society. Um, and uh, until the opposition uh, provides a concrete program and concrete policy proposals, um, it would be very difficult for them to win because I think the, uh, the civil society in Poland is strong, but our political parties are very weak and they actually do not provide any credible alternative to what the law and justice is doing. So uh, actually, even within Poland, when you look at campaigning or at policy propositions or policy ideas, the law and justice, we may like it or not, but I mean, they are leading uh, on the ideas front as well. I mean, they at least have some ideas, uh, whereas the opposition is always um, co complaining and actually Actually, it's splintered. So um, I'm not advocating the, uh, the united opposition in Poland as it worked in Hungary, because I don't think it's a good idea. I think it would be best uh, that we have uh, several parties that actually can appeal to liberals, to leftists or to, let's say, um, people who are uh, closer to uh, Christian Democrats. Um, but I think that these parties need to work and they need to uh, actually have some policy solutions that they can promote to people because otherwise it is like uh, putting a spell on voters and trying to uh, convince them that they should vote for someone that is not governing currently but this would be also not very rational because it would be putting a bet on on a party that doesn't really have any program and that is i think the biggest problem also for donald tusk's um civic platform party mm. Thank you. I mean, that would be a whole. I we should have another event about um, Polish politics and uh, and the prospects for Donald Tusk. That's a, a fascinating subject in itself. But uh, let me give Laurent the final word because at the, at the very beginning, if I could go back to what you said, you said only the European Parliament and the European Court of Justice have been playing a positive role. I mean, do you think is that are the, is that enough? to contain the rule of law crisis? I mean, you say finally, well, after 10 years, 10 years too late, but the EU has woken up to this issue. But do you now feel that the EU is on a better path or maybe also more broadly the, that the the Council of Europe is on, a, is on a better path when it comes to confronting the rule of law crisis? Um, so perhaps to, uh, um, to say something of more of a positive nature to conclude uh, this evening's uh, proceedings. Uh, uh, what I've seen in the past uh, few months uh, is something new. I've seen for the very first time since I've been following this uh, issue of rule of law black sliding in the EU, uh, the end of the state of denial. Uh, for a long time, I used to go to Brussels and talk to officials uh, and then they would not simply believe what I was uh, telling them was the situation in Hungary and Poland. So there was a, a, a lot of denial, whether it was uh, just uh, uh, just a real denial or just fake denial just to sleep better at night, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the environment uh, has changed uh, in the past, uh, the past few months. There is now more understanding um, but the fact that uh, rule of law backsliding is an existential threat to the EU. So that's new. Uh, that wasn't the case even uh, 12 months ago. Uh, uh, evidence of this is the speech by the president of the European Court of Justice last week. This would not have been uh, thinkable just uh, even uh, 12 months ago. So I think there is a growing realization that this is, uh, we run the risk of this going, getting out of hand with the EU ending up in a lose-lose situation. Uh, autocratic forces on the rise and then uh, losing political capital from pro-EU forces, so to speak, essentially uh, EU taxpayers, EU citizens uh, valuing the rule of law and democracy, getting fed up with an organization unable to deal with authoritarianism, but also, in fact, uh, ending up subsidizing uh, the consolidation cost of uh, quasi-dictatorial regimes. So the EU is at a crossroads. 
he may well end up in a lose-lose situation, but possibly not because of the growing realization that this is a clear and present danger to the EU and in particular its legal order. So uh, the positive, uh, the silver lining is that it would seem that more and more people are aware of the dangers of not doing anything or just stalling for times, so which is usually the, the default position of the EU. Now, whether that's going to be enough, whether it's not, uh, again, uh, too little, too late, I don't know. Uh, but uh, in the short term, yes, the situation, I think, in Poland is going to get worse. Um, they might just, uh, I think they've gone too far. I don't see how uh, we can salvage the situation without uh, them just completely going in full reverse mode. In the case of Hungary, uh, Orban is uh, potentially uh, in uh, most likely going to lose elections in a few months' time, but uh, this should not be cause for optimism because he has prepared the grounds for actually completely undermining the day-to-day -day workings of uh, the new government should he lose elections. So the system has already been rigged in case of them losing the election. So there would again be an Hungarian problem, so to speak, uh, within a year or two following election, they may well end up losing. So silver lining, uh, there is bigger awareness of the existential threat uh, this uh, rule of law backsliding process is creating in the EU. Thank you. Thank you. So a silver lining, but still lots of dark clouds on the horizon. And, yes, well, I'm thank afraid. you. Thank you to all our speakers. I've learned a lot and I think it's been a really fascinating uh, event. So thank you for, very much for all your wonderful contributions and thank you to everyone for, who took part and for all the excellent questions we've had. This is the moment where we would all applaud if we were sitting together in the same room, but I invite you just to, <laughs> to uh, uh, well, to pay, pay your own tribute to the speakers in the privacy of your room. And uh, I don't know if Dionysus would like to come in and uh, and say a goodbye to to everyone but he has pointed out that the newsletter is available on the link and you have all the useful links from long so that's all from me and i'll hand you back over to Jonathan. thank you very briefly jennifer uh, many thanks to you for chairing the event and doing so very well and of course uh, all of the speakers and the audience who have joined us this evening have learned a lot and i look forward to editing the video and making it available to uh, those who did not manage to join us today. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your effort today. And I hope we will be able to welcome you back to Berkbeck live face to face in a proper academic event. Indeed. <laughs> Laurent, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, uh, Judith. Thanks very much indeed, Jennifer, as well.